for those of you who do not know me, my name is Rachel. I am the registrar at Peters Valley and I am your host for this evening. We have a wonderful lineup of artists speaking for tonight, so we'll get started, but first the general rules. Uh, most of you probably know the drill by now. Please mute your audio and turn off your video so all focus is on the speaker when we begin shortly. And just so you know, as each instructor is introduced, we will post a short biography and their website addresses in the chat, which is located at the bottom of your screen. There will not be time for questions and answers, so we ask that you please contact the artist through their website if you have any questions for them. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, Lauren Eckert. Lauren Eckert is a multimedia object maker and illustrator from New Jersey. Her work has been exhibited in venues such as the Museum Arnhem in Amsterdam, Aramont School of Arts and Crafts, Form and Concept Gallery in Santa Fe, and Peters Valley. In 2018, she curated the show, The Virtual Hands, at Te for Temple University. She has received awards including a Shapeways Education Grant, and an artist in residence position at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft in 2019. Her work was included in the 2018 Snag Jewelry and Metal Survey and in current obsession series, So Mint. Eckert attended Tyler School of Art, Temple University in Philadelphia, where she received her Bachelor's of Fine Art in Metals, Jewelry, CAD, CAM. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen and we can get started. Okay, um, so my name is Lauren Eckert. Uh, thank you for joining me. And um, thank you for Peter, to Peters Valley for giving me a platform to share my work. Um, my website is lauren underscore eckert.com and my Instagram handle is um, underscore lauren underscore eckert underscore. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me after um, all the talks are over. So, um, I, so this is a, this is a picture from 2001 A Space Odyssey and that's a movie that uh, I started my artistic career being really inspired by. Um, the metals jewelry CAD CAM program at Temple University is very technology focused. So I became very interested in 3D printing and computer aided design. Um, combined with my love of science fiction movies, my artwork centered around a lot of the concepts and aesthetics of technology and speculative fiction. I love sci-fi for how imaginative it is and sometimes for the existential horror of the genre. Uh, this is a picture from Blade Runner. Um, both Blade Runner and 2001 talk about artificial intelligence, space travel, how industry augments the human body. Um, and that's something that's especially interesting to me as a trained jeweler. I also love the maximalist color palette of science fiction. Industrial aesthetics can be pretty gray. So using a lot of color in my work is a reference to the imagination and wonder in these worlds. Um, some other science fiction films that inspire me include the original Ghost in the Shell, Akira, Alien, and Event Horizon, but the list, the list goes on. Um, so this is some of my work. I created this series titled A Virtual Body using the funds awarded to me through my Shapeways grant and a merit stipend from Temple University while I was a junior in college. The forms are inspired by medical imaging equipment, early smartphone designs, and video game controllers. Pieces have both a tangible component and a hologram, which is the greenish part that you see right here. Um, and a hologram that uses augmented reality technology and QR codes. Augmented reality is the technology used in Instagram face filters and popular video games like Pokemon Go. The tangible components are entirely 3D printed. So that was the um, CAD CAM part of my education. And then you can also see how the high contrast production design of 2001 is present in my own artwork and designs. Uh, the tangible and virtual components of the series of virtual body represent the dual experiences of existing in both a tangible and virtual world. I was thinking about how my experience and other people's experience of me is influenced by my digital self on the internet. And then this photo shoot was part of a workshop with the contemporary jewelry magazine current obsession at Temple University. Learning how to do art direction was really fun, especially finding other ways to create a brightly colored and artificial environment. And then I ended up working with um, Current Obsession later on for New York City Jewelry Week. And they're just a really great uh, platform. If you're more interested in art jewelry, you should check them out. 
And so um, I also, another thing that I draw inspiration from is science fiction illustration. I really like the glossiness and bubbly and dynamic form language. Um, metal infrastructure is a big part of the aesthetics of utopian and dystopian worlds, and I wanted to reference that in my own metalworking. So I took that inspiration and um, my desire to use color in my work brought me to titanium, which is a metal that can be colored using a process called anodizing. I started using computer aided design and a hydraulic press to create these faceted bubble forms that reference the futuristic aesthetic that um, I showed you in those illustrations. And these pendants are very geometric and they have strong silhouettes influenced by imaginary spaceships. So here's a video of um, how the anodizing process works. It's one of my favorite parts of using titanium. It happens really fast. Um, so there's an element of instant gratification and it looks kind of scientific. So it makes for a fun demonstration for, um, especially when I was demonstrating for uh, high school students, they really liked it. And it works by running an electrical current through the metal. And depending on the amount of electricity, you can get different colors. And so this video that I just showed you is running through the whole spectrum of possible colors. So it goes from like a deep purple all the way up to like a kind of pearlescent blue, blues and greens, and then a bunch of different colors in between that. And I'm wearing rubber gloves in the video so that I don't shock myself, um, which has happened a few times, <laughs> but I've learned how to not do it anymore. And then I'm also an illustrator, which started mostly on a whim when I wanted to do something a little different from metalworking. My style is inspired by a lot of 8-bit pixelated styles of video games, older video games like Pokemon, Zelda, and newer games like Hyper Light Drifter and Stardew Valley. This is a, this is a, um, a GIF from the game Hyper Light Drifter, uh, which has really beautiful design and illustration and artwork in it. Um, so I use th that illustration style um, in this collection of digital collages printed on fabric scarves. Um, I was using a program called KidPix that I first used in elementary school computer class. It was basically Photoshop for children. When we were supposed to be doing typing lessons, I would usually be playing around on this program instead. And I would just be filling the screen with as much content as possible, which, you know, is kind of the beginning of my maximalist aesthetic. So feeling nostalgic, I re-downloaded the program and started, started using it to make collage components that I then arrange on Photoshop. And this was the first one I made and the gems are kind of a reference to my jewelry background. So then I had the residency in Houston, um, which started this past December. And I wanted to change up the way I was working with the titanium because I was ready for something new, but also because my hydraulic press was too heavy to move from New Jersey to Texas. <laughs> so there was a practical element in that decision as well. Um, and I wanted to bridge the gap between my 8-bit illustrations and my metalworking. So I decided to try weaving the titanium so each little woven square would be visually similar to a square pixel. I've seen woven metal before with silver and copper, but not with titanium, and I thought the anodized colors would provide a bright contrast that has a similar visual effect and palette to my drawings. Also, I started working with mild steel as a skeleton for these elements because I assisted with a steel fabrication for jewelry class at Peters Valley this past summer, and I loved it. Um, Lynn Batchelder taught that class, and it was, it was really fun. And then, so I'm like trying to make these like staticky pixels, and it was, when I was a kid, I would rub my hands all over the TV screen to like feel the static. And so that's kind of what I was thinking of when I was thinking of all these pixels in the staticky image I wanted. So after proving my concept with my first woven pixels piece, I was thinking about the density of digital images and I wanted to make the weaving even tighter to give it a staticky feel like when I would rub my hands on television screens as a kid. So I created this um, and it's my second woven pixels piece. I doubled the density of the, the weave and made this kind of miasmic cloud of digital static. If you run your fingers over the metal, it almost feels like the zesting side of a cheese grater, so it has a nice texture too. The size of the base plate is about the limit of what my anodizing machine can anodize. If you were to use a larger machine, you could probably do bigger pieces, but this is about what I can approach with my studio. And then another reason I like titanium is because it's um, not that dense of a material, so I can make really lightweight pieces um, using I can make really lightweight pieces relative to the amount of material I'm using. So it's very light. And then, so after testing out my colorful woven titanium and being satisfied with the results, I added some other elements to create this piece. While a wearable necklace, it's more of an object that hangs from these two 3D printed claws I designed. 
I'm using my woven titanium as a decorative element that still creates a digital futuristic vibe, but also as a mechanical element and cold connection between the steel and titanium geometric forms. I wanted this piece to be something you would arrive at in the midst of a journey, like maybe some part of imaginary castle or cavern as an object that could be some sort of loot that might serve as an amulet of protection, or maybe it even sets off a trap when you remove it, which is kind of coming from my inspiration from video games. Um, and this is an image from Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. Um, and so video games are really interesting to me as an illustrator because there's a lot of world building and lore and creatures. And as a craftsperson, because there's a lot of interesting objects that help your character along. And then this is another closer photograph of the same, of the same uh, work. And then so uh, coronavirus happened and I didn't have access to my studio anymore at my residency. So I went back to my illustrations and I was thinking about Aronis Bosch and the medieval artwork and kind of the world building inherent in his pieces. So I started uh, drawing my own Bosch-like creatures and I created a bunch of elements to later collage together, including a bunch of these amorphous creatures with human-like features. And uh, I created this large gateway as a portal to my new world. And I'm also doing a lot of research into mythology and folklore. And so I made all these collage elements and then I brought them together into this triptych. triptych. Um, and it's quite large at 36 inches tall. And I wanted the top to have more of a heavenly feeling and color palette and the bottom to have a more chthonic underworld atmosphere. And all the little icons are chosen intentionally to create different environments throughout the piece. And then this is the final piece I made. This is the final piece I'm gonna show you. Um, and it's the first piece I made after returning home from my Houston residency and having access to my entire studio again. So I decided to make something really big. Um, and I used tape and toner transfers to mask off part of the surface of the titanium so that when I anodize it, the masked portion becomes a different color, creating the patterns and illustrations. And then I'm still using my woven pixels along with celestial and creature imagery like the stars and clawed mount. And it's a similar concept to the first synthetic relic piece, but I started um, using acrylic paints on the surface of the anodized titanium to supplement the color palette of the metal. And if you're in Houston, the Houston area this fall, you can see it in the upcoming In Residence exhibition at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And then lastly, this is a picture of my mom and me at my first ever jewelry sale and my dog. Uh, so thank you for listening to my talk and I will end my screen share now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, thank you so much. Right, our next speaker tonight is David Heim. David Heim is the author of SketchUp Success for Woodworkers and a frequent contributor to Woodcraft Magazine. He teaches SketchUp at the Brookfield Craft Center, the Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking, and the Austin School of Furniture and Design. When he's not working with SketchUp, he can usually be found at the lathe in his shop. From 2016 to 2019, he was a member of the Board of Directors of the American Association of Woodturners. Welcome, David. Thank you, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here and be part of the Peters Valley uh, presentations. Um, let me. I do consider myself uh, a woodworker and a wood turner, but my my real love is the three D design program called SketchUp. Uh, SketchUp is a computer aided design program, uh, but compared with AutoCAD or TurboCAD or Blender or Revit or any of those other programs, SketchUp is uh, way easier to use and way less expensive. The people in Boulder, Colorado who developed SketchUp call it CAD for the rest of us. Uh, I teach courses in SketchUp. I'll be teaching one here at Peters Valley later in the fall. Uh, it's centered around what I consider the four really essential good practices you need to understand in order to uh, make SketchUp behave. But once you do that, once you get your head around those, those good practices, you can use SketchUp to help plan and design the things you want to do in just about any other craft. Uh, my main activity in SketchUp 
is modeling furniture. Let me just share my screen. Bear with me for a second. Will I get the right stuff up here? I like to do famous furniture by Bible and furniture that just interests me for one reason or another. I'll give you a, a short tour of some of my favorite pieces. This is a dressing table Thomas Seymour. And it's fully nailed. All the jewelry is there. You can pull the drawers out if you like it. Uh, next, Hans Fegner's iconic chair. Another icon. The molded plywood chair by Charles and Ray Eames. Here's a more recent molded plywood chair by Joe Colombo. And we have one of Wendell Castle's music stands. And finally, the power play armchair and the offside ottoman by Frank Gehry, who happens to be Canadian and so he's a hockey fan. I want to end my brief presentation here with a short video that will show you how a, a SketchUp model can come together and how quickly that can happen. Let me go back to sharing my screen again. Okay, let's make a table in about five minutes flat. Begin with a square down here at the origin and pull it up to its full length and we'll make it a component. Some guidelines so I know where the other three legs will go. Grab the move tool and make some copies. And move it along. Do the same thing to get the remaining pair of legs. And again, flip the along. those top edges and moving them down four inches. That sets the beginning of the taper on the leg. Let's zoom in for a look at the bottom of the leg. Highlight that face and those edges. Use the scale tool. And that creates our taper. select for the moment. Just quickly put in a stretcher. Just drawing right in place between the legs. Give it its thickness and make it a component. Move it back a little bit to create a shadow line here. A square table I can copy and rotate to make the remaining stretchers to put on its center point. Grab the copy rotate tool and rotate 90 for the first copy. Type 3x for the remaining copies. There we are.
and we'll very quickly put in and on the end of this stretcher using the offset tool to define the tenon push pull it to its right length copying all that geometry and attach it to the base of the stretcher Now I'm going to zoom in those because I want to put in the mortises. Switch to X-ray view. Open up my leg for editing. Outline the base of that tenon. A little bit here. There we go. So our table structure is done. Now it's time to add the top. Let's get rid of these guidelines. Start with a square here. And enlarge it with the offset tool for a little overhang. And delete that original square. Top up three fourths of an inch to give it thickness. Of course, now I want to make it a component. And our last operation is to put a little profile on the underside of the top. I use follow me for that. Here we go. Simple little table, nine parts, three components, one five minute model. So that's SketchUp in a nutshell. I um, want to thank you all for watching. And uh, again, uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of uh, Peter's Valley. I look forward to teaching the class in the fall. That was great, David. Thank you so much. And I did see that um, we did put the link for your workshop in the chat. So if anyone's interested, it's down there for more information. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Darren Fisher. Darren Fisher is a Keyport, New Jersey artist whose works in metal, wood, and earth include jewelry, furniture, decorative arts, and indoor-outdoor installations. Darren received a BA in environmental geography with a studio art minor from Millersville University. Upon graduation, he was quickly accepted as a resident artist and metalsmith at Aramont School of Art and Craft. Subsequent situations have included blacksmith and sculptor for fine architectural metalsmiths in Florida, New York, and jewelry studio supervisor at the University of the Arts, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Darren is the manager of the sculpture, jewelry, and 3D design studios at New Jersey City University, where he received his MFA in sculpture in 2014. He is now an adjunct professor currently teaching jewelry, three-dimensional design, and sculpture. Welcome, Darren. Hello, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Okay, so uh, let's see. Let's start the screen share. And Sorry about that. Oh, no. Where did it go to? There we are. Okay, presenter view. Okay, so welcome. Uh, my name is Darren Fisher. Um, I have a degree in environmental science. You will see that in a lot of my work. Um, but ever since undergrad, I haven't touched that degree. Um, uh, I have some influences in mechanics and industrial science, um, but nothing formal like a degree, but you'll see that as well. Uh, the piece you're looking at right now is a cuff bracelet. 
It is the first piece of jewelry uh, that I made in college, uh, sterling silver with a nickel silver overlay. Um, we don't really use nickel silver anymore, but this was, you know, late 90s, so anything went. Um, but yeah, so this was the first piece, then um, it kind of just blossomed from there. Uh, at Peters Valley, I teach uh, spoon making, measuring spoons, flatware. I teach an heirloom flatware class. Um, a lot of my work is sculptural, but fully functional. Um, this piece also includes some found object work. Um, so this is a spork. Um, the handle is a concrete tie that's used in masonry construction. Um, and then the spoon and fork section is um, sterling silver. It's forged and fabricated, uh, detail of the back. Um, it's actually composed of roughly seven different pieces that have been soldered together and riveted to the handle. It has a little bevel there too, so if you do need to cut some pieces, you can, you can do that lightly, and it's not too sharp, so it's not gonna cut you while you're using it. Uh, the next transition in this work was the full flatware set. Uh, same idea, um, just a different uh, design sensibility. Um, I used some roller printing of lace to create the, um, the design on, on the utensil ends. This is um, some ice cream spoons. The, the handles are forged iron. Um, once again, the spoons are sterling silver. Uh, there's a feather in the background, which is also a sterling. And the little pearls and beads that you see are um, fine silver. Um, that was referenced in, um, or I was inspired by the plate mushrooms that you see in, on trees growing. So um, I worked a lot with that. Um, you'll see a lot of these fine silver beads in my early work along with this copper bowl. Um, it's a rather large bowl. This was right outside of college when I left and didn't have a studio. So you can see it's, it's, a, it's a little rough, but um, in terms of the edge, it's an unfinished edge. Um, I made this with uh, like two hammers and a tree stump and my torches. Um, super basic, but um, so you can see there's, there's nothing too complicated in its, its construction, but it's all about the, the form and shape. Um, sterling silver bowl. This one is titled uh, White Satin Dirt Devil. Um, that's the mesoscale small wind patterns that you see whipping up uh, dirt and, and small debris on the side. This is um, sterling silver. Uh, the bowl part is raised from flat sheet, so it's hand hammered, and the base is hot forged from a rough ingot. An ingot is just a, a rough casting of metal with no shape and then everything is hammered into shape from there. Uh, this piece is probably, um, it's maybe six inches by six inches square, that kind of thing, nothing too large. Um, getting into some of my references of, of mechanics and, and my upbringing, this is, uh, it's, it's one of two things. It can either be a coffee can, um, a, a coffee pot or an oil can. So depending on what you're drinking that day, um, it's a large piece. It's a 12 cup capacity. The handle is found object. It's a pipe fitters wrench. Um, and, and once again, this is sort of just, you know, I, I grew up around my father and we always fixed cars in the garage or in the driveway. Um, so this is really just kind of my roots. Uh, I'm a jeweler. I do wedding bands often, but I, I incorporate alternative materials into the pieces. Uh, this is, um, the, the yellowish gold is actually green gold. Uh, the center band is pure iron, and then it's white gold on the other side. Um, the interesting thing about this is that um, the pure iron has started um, kind of uh, oxidizing and weathering away. So it's not as flush as it was on the inside before. So it's, uh, they're changing over time. I doubt they're gonna fully disintegrate, but um, it's, it's just interesting to see that uh, certain metals actually uh, erode away uh, while worn on the body. Another set of wedding bands. Uh, this is 18 karat gold and a stainless steel Damascus with a, a tube set diamond. Uh, I don't have any tattoos, um, surprisingly. 
Um, you know, they think everybody that works in metal has to have a tattoo, but uh, it's not the case for me. Um, I use belt buckles as my badge or, or my identifier, I guess you could say. Uh, this is a BNS gauge or, or a sheet metal gauge or a wire gauge, depending on what you're measuring. Um, so it's, it's a rather large piece. It's three and a half inches in diameter. It's a little sharp. So um, it also kind of keeps your belt line in check. Um, you, can, you can tell when you've had a little bit too much to eat when it's digging into you. Um, but found object um, and sterling silver riveted to the inside detail of the back. Another belt buckle. This is um, a sand cast. I used a, a model of a gear cutter uh, which is made for cutting gears in industry. Um, it was sand cast. This is sterling silver. It's a rather chunky piece. Um, it actually weighs um, just, just shy of a pound. So it's about a pound of sterling silver. Um, so right now the market is pretty hot for, for metals. Um, so this piece is, is rising in value as we speak, which I'm pretty excited about. <laughs> But um, once again, really uncomfortable if, if you're eating too much uh, that day. Um, so uh, in line with the um, formal engagement rings and wedding bands that I do, I do rings. Um, this is a siren series, uh, rings that, that function as, as art and sculpture. Uh, they can be worn on the body. Um, it's a, a copper, um, copper tower per se. And this is a turned aluminum um, ring. So in the center, what you can see is a, is a ruby. Sorry. Um, it's a ruby set in 18 karat gold and uh, spun aluminum. Detail. And then there it is off of the, the sculpture. Okay, another one of the towers. Uh, this one is rather tall, it's 18 inches tall. Um, it's a sterling silver ring. Uh, that's yellow topaz set in 18 karat gold as well. Um, so uh, functional, uh, not exactly comfortable. You know, when you're wearing this ring, you can't exactly put it, your hand in your pocket, but um, everybody will notice you. Uh, so moving on to my larger sculptures, um, I've, I've always had this uh, uh, thing with towers and, and power lines and, and the way we communicate, you know, hence the Siren series. Um, so this is the larger work that I've done. This is rammed earth, uh, which I kind of manipulated the, the formula to. So it's not exactly rammed earth that you use in formal construction. Um, this was meant to decay over time. Um, there's a, a series of towers. Um, these were installed back in 2014 um, and they are still up and they're still eroding and changing. Um, it's sort of indicative of, of our society and communication and erosion. Um, and, you know, considering 2020, uh, we're, we're in good pace for, for things. Um, so this piece uh, has a pedestal that a viewer can stand on. All of these have some type of interaction to them, at least the ones with pedestals. Uh, so this one has a NOAA um, weather radio that broadcasts. Um, this is recent. So this was just a, um, a week ago that I took this. So um, six years later and the pieces have really changed, eroded. Uh, this piece I took down partially, but um, they're crumbling back into the earth uh, rather beautifully. So it's, it's this living exhibition. Um, you can see this was really just raw dirt and some Portland cement, like a very low percentage, like 1%. So it was meant to like decompose a lot sooner than it did. Um, and there was really no organic matter in it, but uh, life has, has risen from it. And it's really, if you can see up there, it's hard to see, but there is a, a, a little tree growing from the top. And finally, back to some formal sculpture, uh, gallery sculpture, museum sculpture. Um, I brought forth diamonds from Marcel Tokowski's um, book on diamond design. Um, so these are 42 inch diameter diamonds in MDF and plywood. That's me in its um, building state, just you can see the scale of it. Um, that was me hoping and wishing that it would sell. I still own it, um, as many sculptures, you know, you, you make them, you own them, unless they go in public spaces. Um, and furniture. Uh, so this piece is um, a, uh, it's called surface tension. Uh, the granite 
top, which is hard to see, is 1,100 pounds, um, and the base is all tension set in. So it was influenced by a tension setting stone in jewelry. So I took a very large measured stone as we set in, in prong settings all the time and created furniture from that idea. Um, and finally, moving on to that, um, this is the same piece with an armature. Um, I call this surface tension mass reduction, where it has actually become a functional table um, where I've removed the granite um, and just use a wire frame with a glass top. And that is all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Darren. That was great. Great. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Janine Wang. Janine began making furniture while studying architecture at the Cooper Union and found herself much more drawn to building than the planning of building. She went on to pursue an MFA in furniture design from the Rhode Island School of Design and has since exhibited in the Center of Art and Wood, Aramont School of Arts and Crafts, the Wharton Estrick Museum, the American Association of Woodturners Gallery of Wood Art, Appalachian Center for Craft, the AAW International Woodturning Symposium, the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education, and the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Janine. Hi, uh, thanks for that introduction. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so I was going to teach a intro to bowl turning class and also a um, basket weaving into wood turning class at Peters Valley. So I'm just going to focus on wood turning for this presentation just to kind of stay relevant. Um, but I did start out before I learned how to build things as a drawer. And um, this was my last very, like, last real serious drawing endeavor. It's a self-portrait of me, um, scrutinizing myself and trying to figure out what portraits are for. Um, I ended up moving on to make a series that I called Body at Work, um, trying to find the essence of, like, a person through their portrait without any material signifiers or, like, symbolic symbolism and objects. Um, I did these live and, like, full scale, just drew people working. And I felt like this was a very honest portrait of who they actually were. And so that led to my first piece of furniture for humans. Uh, this is a very basic, very rough stool, but the, um, the top seating area is made of spindles and all those spindles can turn freely. So actually for something this like hard and lumpy looking all lined up like that, it's actually really comfortable because what the body wants to do is move and not sit in place. So, um, well, I always thought of it as like, if you think of a chair in side profile, it's this like super hard angles, lowercase h. And from a really young age, we kind of get trained to sit in that age. Like you get trained to like sit still with your back up straight and like your feet both down, maybe like your elbows at your sides. And that's just not really natural. We're training ourselves to fit into the furniture rather than building furniture to fit us. So the second thing that I really liked and that made this very comfortable was the fact that wood turning creates doubly curved surfaces. And the body is made of doubly curved surfaces. So we're really drawn to these kinds of shapes. Um, yeah, wood turning is amazing if you guys haven't tried it. <laughs> uh, it's like really satisfying and really gratifying and it's just this direct um, immediate satisfaction that you can get from like even my first horribly turned spindle. As soon as I put my hand on that, I was like, wow, that's the shape that I was meant to interact with. So I tried a bunch of stuff in my first year, maybe year and a half on the lathe. And I came to this pattern that I really liked. Um, 
it is sized to the dimensions of my hand so that when I grab it, like when you get the dimensions just right, it is really awesome to hold. So I was thinking about a way to use like spindles or like to use ornament in a functional way. Um, well, often spindle turning is ornamental, but it's also like quietly functional. So I wanted to make a piece of furniture that kind of like framed this ornament. Um, and you can see it is meant to be picked up. So I named it the grabbable table even though it's kind of also a little bit at bench height too, so you kind of feel invited to pick it up and move it around. And it's actually, when you pick it up, it's being pleasant to you. Like picking up a puppy instead of slightly unpleasant and sharp. Um, I also went through a phase of turning a lot of one-legged stools, all different kinds and shapes and dimensions. The one-legged stool is this kind of, it's like an ancient typology of furniture where you just have the stool and then one leg sticking out of it. And the idea is you use your two legs to be the other, like to complete the, the system. So you are part of the chair. Um, I, I actually, <laughs> that, that one on the uh, upper left, on the left side, shouldn't be standing up straight like that because you really do need a person. I have no idea how the photographer got that to stand, but it's supposed to be like something that you actively use. Um, and what I also really liked about this was it's not something that we're so from like we don't see it every day growing up. So you don't know exactly how to use them. And when you put them in the hands of other people, they actually can come up with all the functions and like find things that I never would have thought of myself. Um, from there, I went and made a series of, I called it the couple cup series. Um, these, uh, then I made bowls, so it's kind of just called the couple bowl series. Um, each one of these vessels is made or based around a hand gesture. So, uh, like for example, the one on the left is a, it's the hug mug. I have the first prototype here actually. It's really nice to hold and give a little hug. Um, I really like the idea of the person's gesture being what actually um, informs what the thing looks like. And I really like the idea of like the kind of postures you take on defining, defining yourself and building your own character. So like if you stand up straight and you have an open posture every day, maybe you'll be a more confident person. So each one of these pieces ends up having its own personality. There's the hug mug. Um, second is the stabilizer. Third on the right is, I call it a small latte because that's how I hold them. The sweetener, power chalice, hors d'oeuvres, uh, friendly fingers, offering one, offering two, but get the point. And um, this is a collaboration with my partner. Can't really see it in this photo, but it's a nightstand. And that handle on top, the darker part is oak, and that's actually steam bent. It's a steam bent split turning with the same uh, turning pattern profile that I used earlier. It's a nightstand for everything you don't want anyone to see. Um, these were for the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. They had to fell a lot of ash trees due to the emerald ash borer epidemic. It's uh, the emerald ash borer is this tail bug, but it's uh, it invaded North America from Asia, and it's decimating all of our ash trees. Um, they're all going to be eliminated. It's pretty scary, and so part of the prevention effort is to cut sick trees down so they don't just house and breed these bugs. Um, so yeah, the Schuylkill Center just wanted to raise awareness about that, and I thought. 
maybe the best way to deal with such a depressing problem is to bring the trees into your house. And um, the series is called Holding On in the Aftermath because right now we don't have a solution. And um, I, they cut down a tree the day before I got there that was sick. And um, sick trees have physical manifestations of their sickness. So I took some of those areas and just made them into handles that you can then interact with. And I mean, they're made for people too. So the idea was to create like a, a cross connection between species. It's a little small, but on that little photo, you can see there's a fissure right down the middle. That's because of the emerald ash borer. And um, in 2018, I took a basket weaving workshop at Peters Valley, which was super amazing. And I just started going ham. Um, I was taught by Pamela Wilson. She was really great. Um, I, again, collaborated a lot with my partner, who is a fantastic steam vendor. And we worked on trying to figure out like what we can do with that crossover. So. Um, reed basketry is just beautiful when it's lit up because it's thin and it's like translucent and its form just can be manipulated so well so uh, we tried a couple different things this one is called lure it's inspired by fishing with my partner um, and the cord slides all the way through the arm so we can lower and raise it at will uh, this one's called Smaller Worlds, which I sent to the AAW Symposium this year to, to join many other tiny smaller worlds, was the idea, because uh, I couldn't make it. And yeah, so this is kind of what I was going to teach this year, the crossover between wood turning and basket turning. Thanks. Thank you so much, Janine. It was beautiful seeing your work. Right. Our final speaker tonight is Elizabeth Tokely. Elizabeth Tokely is a graduate of Cranbrook Academy of Art and the founder of Eat Metal Art Jewelry Gallery and Metal Studio. Her work exhibits nationally and can be found at events such as Craft New York, Peters Valley Craft Fair, Sugarloaf, and Art Riders. Elizabeth has been an instructor for over 18 years at the 92nd Street Y. She conducts classes at Peters Valley, Snow Farm School of Craft, Visual Arts Center of Summit, and the Arts School at Old Church. Elizabeth is published in numerous jewelry books and magazines such as Metalsmith, British Vogue, and her Japanese hexagonal collar graces the cover of Chainmail Jewelry Contemporary Designs from Classic Techniques. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I miss being at Peters Valley this summer. It was kind of a bummer, but all good. Um, so yeah, so let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so um, so yeah, so my work um, is really probably about investigating um, math and nature. Um, this is a uh, sketch or a collage. Um, it's a uh, paper, it's found object, it's uh, wood, um, and it's a uh, fabricated um, metal uh, copper sphere. Um, and the title is, It's All About a Circle. Um, when I was like studying math and nature, I also started kind of investigating um, armillary spheres and um, celestial globes. Um, so armillaries were um, models that represented longitude and latitude and um, globes were maps of the constellations. So this was a piece that I did. Um, it is, um, it's, it's, I guess etched copper. Um, the piece in the center is uh, hydraulic pressed and um, it's pierced and sawed. And, um, and then I guess each of the sections kind of rotate and move. 
So um, I began viewing nature through simple geometric forms. Um, it seemed that both uh, math and art were important to understand nature. Um, this piece is from a series of objects that I did. Um, so it's called Synthesis. Um, it's, the title of it is actually um, Skeletal Cube Octahedron. And I wanted to make a collection of objects that represented a, a fictional evolution or a family tree of uh, simple geometric forms. Um, this is patinaed copper and bronze. And this is like one of the heads of the family tree. Um, so this is a wall piece um, and it's from that same series. It's like the other head of the family tree. And um, it's a cube octahedron. It is made up of two squared pyramids. They're hollow forms um, and both of them spin and rotate um, as it hangs on the wall. So this is the uh, family tree or a installation of this family tree. So um, the entire uh, piece is called synthesis. Okay, so I, I like to um, use these studies um, to make collections of art jewelry. So um, this is a detailed shot of some of those uh, pieces that are in um, the collection of synthesis. And this is a pair of earrings that you see on the right, um, which is one of the elements that I use within this uh, evolution. Um, this is a piece that I did. It's called uh, Continuous Tetrad Necklace. Um, it's from my collection, Infinite Energy. Um, it's patinaed sterling silver. It's 18 karat gold pins. So all the pieces kind of pivot and move and it kind of pivots and moves around your neck. Um, it's made up of seven different units. All of the rings are forged from thin to thick and then they're all pinned together. Um, so within the collections, um, or I make um, limited edition pieces. So this is an 18 karat gold forged circle. Um, and then the earrings are uh, sapphire briolettes and they graduate in size and color. Um, so I use, I guess, more traditional kind of forging techniques. Um, this is a statement piece from my collection called Elements. Um, I use a lot of simple lines, primary forms, um, and I like to work with multiples and repeated patterns. Um, these are a pair of cufflinks from that same collection. Um, when I was working with these hard geometric forms, um, I was very interested in seeing how they would react if I um, built them out of chain mail. So I did a series of um, chain mail geometric shapes. So it was really kind of interesting to see these hard edge forms become very soft and pliable. Um, this is called anamorph cuboctahedron. Um, I, I used um, patterns from the series uh, to create a collection called uh, Rings of Pattern. This is a Japanese hexagonal pattern and this um, collar has about, about, um, about 1200 rings. So I studied different techniques from Japan and from Old English, and, um, and these pieces are um, open round chain mail, um, idiot's delight, and um, round chain mail. Um, I circled back to kind of looking into constellations, and um, these are love you tags that I did, and they're based on geometry found in constellations. 
So love you tags are kind of for people who want to feel a connection to the universe and, and somebody else that they care about. So like, for example, I wear my two kids. Okay, hold on. I'm, I think I'm in. Oh, you know what? Oh, I, so this piece, um, I was invited to do, um, I'm sorry about that. I, I think I missed a slide. Um, so I was invited to participate in the MJSA mystery box design challenge. This was where um, they sent you a box of materials and um, the box of materials uh, you had to accept and then within 30 days you had to build a piece um, based on the materials you received. I had wanted to show you a picture of what that, um, what that looked like. But um, anyway, that was like inspired by um, vintage styled uh, layered chains um, and Victorian jewelry and, and um, ancient, ancient um, Egyptian work. Um, so this is a piece um, that was then inspired by um, that, that necklace that I kind of missed the slide on. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so yeah. Um, so here I, I opened up Eat Metal Art Jewelry Gallery and Metal Studio in about 2008. Um, so it consisted of a small gallery, um, a, a small school, and a place where I made my work. This is kind of a, an aerial shot of um, what the uh, studio is like. It has benches for about six students and, um, and then a space in the front to show work. Uh, this was one of the classes that I taught at Peters Valley. It was called All About a Circle. And we kind of focused on uh, forging and making circles out of forging. We did chain mail, we did rings, we did pattern and textures. I also, at the uh, gallery, I curated shows on a quarterly basis. And uh, one of the shows was Everyday Earrings. And um, this was based on the idea um, that everyone um, perception of what everyday jewelry would be is very different. It was inspired by um, a client who had purchased this really large chunky pair of earrings for me. And I thought it was so funny how she always said to me, oh, these are my go-to earrings and I, I wear them every day. And so it just made me think about how you know, how different everybody is. Like I would never wear those big earrings every day. I always wear something that's kind of small and. Um, but so it was really interesting that she thought that. So the show consisted of uh, 20 artists and it had about over a hundred pairs of earrings in it. And that's um, just uh, me setting up these, uh, an installation of the artist work. And then this is uh, one of the views of the show. Um, I did another show which was called um, Arm Candy. And Arm Candy was based on the idea of finding an irresistible companion. Um, the idea that a piece of jewelry could give you confidence, uh, renew your sense of belief about yourself. It could make you feel proud. It can create conversation. Um, and I thought it was really interesting and this was some of the pieces that um, people had um, submitted for the show and this is um, the installation of the show. Um, one more show that I, I did was um, Teensy Weensy Wonders and this was um, about um, an object or jewelry that was smaller than the norm. Um, it was about miniature fantasy worlds um, so this piece on the cover was actually a mausoleum for a mouse. Um, this is one of the um, artist's work. This is an installation of the show by um, Tessa Ricker Carpenter. So she does a lot of these kind of like fantasy pieces. Um, so I do commission pieces and um, I do pieces that are designed for a specific recipient. So they're one of a kind um, that are created for, um, you know, some of life's moments like uh, a wedding or a death or an anniversary. Um, this was a print and from the print, 
um, we made this, um, this, uh, this piece. Um, I also design engagement rings and I do um, heirloom repurposing. So this is a piece that's made of seven rings and um, it's from her grandmother, her mother, um, and several engagement rings. It's called uh, the circle of life. Um, so right now, um, I'm currently um, closing the school right now. I'm kind of on a pause and, and uh, not really doing many of the um, shows in the gallery. So it's just gonna kind of be showing my own work. Um, this is a piece that is with Peters Valley. It's uh, for the show. It's called um, Shield from Evil. It's made up of um, emerald sapphires, 14 karat gold, and patinaed. And this on the back of it is um, a piercing and sawing of Japanese hemp. And um, Japanese hemp is actually used to wish children to grow healthy and it's a means to protect you from harm and from evil. And this is me and my kids. And right now I'm kind of refocusing on the new norm and trying to get distance learning for them. So thank you for having me. It was good to see you, Elizabeth. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And that concludes our instructor presentations for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in with us tonight. I hope you will join us again next Friday at 7 p.m. for our last group that we'll be presenting in this series. That's right, next week is the last week of this series. So please make sure you join us so you don't miss it. And until then, thank you so much and have a great weekend. Take care, everybody.